Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And I'm sorry I was unable to be there in person because of something that's come up here. But I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit. And instead of really, as Carlos has done, um, starting with the clinical, I'm going to really move us back into the preclinical work and talk a little bit about mechanisms. And I actually slightly changed my talk uh, to sort of follow more closely, I think, some of Carlos's work. So our focus has been, as I mentioned, preclinical work. And I show here, just as everyone in the audience knows, the characterizations of, of depression. And as a preclinical researcher, it's very difficult to study depression because of the complexity of the disorder. But if you think about how you would get these different symptoms, there's probably many different circuits that are involved and how patients present differently. There's probably different circuits that can go astray leading to depression. And not only that, there's different types of depression. And so it's interesting when you think about antidepressant drugs and how they work, how they potentially work. In terms of typical antidepressants, we don't know. We know that they increase monoaminergic transmission quickly, but they take a while to work. And people have postulated that this lag time produces some sort of plasticity effects, but it's really unclear what type of plasticity. Plasticity isn't just a general term, they're specific types. And it's, it's never been really mechanistically dissected because if you take the drug for a couple for several days to a, a couple of weeks where you typically see efficacy, there are many changes that happen. And not all of them are gonna be important for an antidepressant effect. There's been a lot of talk about circuit remodeling that's necessary, neurogenesis is necessary, spinogenesis changes are necessary, but we really don't know. So we were quite intrigued about the work of ketamine and as everyone knows, um, the slow dose of ketamine that has rapid effects in depressed patients as well as treatment resistant patients. We became in, interested in ketamine for two reasons. The first was that ketamine demonstrates the, the first time it's possible to trigger a pharmacological rapid antidepressant response. And because of that, could we try to work through the mechanism of how you generate an antidepressant effect, in this case, a rapid response? And the second thing was, let's start with the NMDA receptor. Ketamine is a well-characterized NMDA receptor. And could this produce a way to start to look at cellular signaling that may be required? So we did a lot of behavioral pharmacology. This was all done in rodents. And we could show that ketamine could have rapid antidepressant-like effects in certain models. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of data just using one of these models, the four swim test. The reason I'm using this model is because we could demonstrate not only rapid, but the long-term effects of ketamine out to a week, similar to what's seen in patients. We didn't see this with all paradigms, which probably is not surprising. The paradigms that are often used in, when we talk about sort of interchangeably depression and antidepressant responses have all been shown to work with more typical monoaminergic drugs. And it's always been unclear if you have drugs that don't work through monoaminergic transmission, would antidepressants show effects in them? And what we could show is not all these paradigms work in terms of picking up ketamine responses. This is one paradigm that does. All the, par all the data I'm gonna show you has been done with a couple of paradigms. But to begin, our first question we ask is, does it appear that ketamine blocks the NMDA receptor to trigger its effect? So what we did is we did dose response curves, identified a very low dose of ketamine that produced rapid antidepressant effects in these paradigms without the confounds of learning and memory deficits or hyperactivity, which you see when you get to higher doses of ketamine. We also did a dose response curve of MK to one and identified a low dose that also did not have hyperactivity or learning and memory deficits. These are both NMDA receptor antagonists. And what we did is we took C57 wild type animals. We injected this low dose of either ketamine or MK to one, and we tested animals in this paradigm, either 30 minutes, three hours, 24 hours, or one week later. Each of these was a different group of animals. So no animals were retested because of concerns about behavioral habituation. And what we found was that ketamine produces a significant decrease in immobility. And this test, again, is just a test that everyone has heard about where you take an animal of a certain, put it in a certain size beaker with a certain amount of water, a certain temperature, the animal floats, 
the antidepressant response is a movement that's detected the last four to six minutes and is a very defined movement. What we could show is that ketamine decreases immobility suggestive of an antidepressant response very quickly. And that the single dose, again, these are all different groups of animals, is extended for more than a week. MK to one also had very rapid effects, although they're not extended for long term. So it suggested that the NMDA receptor is involved with the rapid effects. And I'm gonna come back to the long-term effects because we have some data on it. But to start, if the NMDA receptor is involved, you block the NMDA receptor, what then? So in previous studies, we had shown that a growth factor, BDNF, was required for typical antidepressants to work. So what we did is we took our animals, and these animals have a loss of BDNF in cortical hippocampal regions, which we think is important for the antidepressant effect. We took these animals and we simply gave them the low dose of ketamine, which is shown on the left, and we said, what happens? And so we have our litter mate controls in white, our BDNF knockouts next to it. Just the deletion of BDNF doesn't change their behavior. If you give the low dose of ketamine, you get this significant decrease in immobility, suggestive of an antidepressant effect in the wild type animals, but it's blocked in the knockouts, showing that BDNF is required. If we look in a separate cohort of animals 24 hours later, again, there's no change just by the loss of BDNF. The wild type animals respond, but if you delete BDNF, you don't. Now, of course, BDNF is not a knockout in humans. It's a polymorphism. So the effects may be more subtle, but we were trying to look at mechanisms. So if BDNF is involved, why would it be involved? How would this really talk to us about a potential cellular progression of signaling? Well, BDNF binds to a high affinity receptor called TREC B. So if BDNF is important, is TREC B important? So what we did is we again generated a different line of animals deleting now this high affinity receptor in this cortical hippocampal regions. And what we could show is again, the deletion of TREC B did not have any effect on the behavior, what's shown here in the middle left. But if you give ketamine to the wild type animals, again, the litter mate controls, they have this significant decrease in immobility, suggesting that this is an antidepressant effect, but it's blocked by the knockout. Again, showing a requirement now, not only for BDNF, but for the signaling downstream of track B. Our data has focused a lot in the cortical hippocampal regions, in particular, the hippocampus region. And part of this is that going through the literature in terms of human imaging, if you look at brain regions that may be involved in terms of depression, there's many, which isn't a surprise because you can have many different symptoms. And again, probably many different circuits that are involved. But when we went through and looked at antidepressant responses, the most consistent region we could find in effect was in the hippocampus. And we've actually localized BDNF being made in the hippocampus for typical antidepressants to work. So we said, what happens if we just simply take animals, wild type animals, give them this low dose of ketamine, and then shortly after dissect out the hippocampus, do we see engagement of track B? Is it activated? Just because you require this beating of track B, do you see an engagement? So we looked at phosphorylation of track B and in fact, it was upregulated. We did a lot of work that I'm not gonna go through trying to work out how do you block NMDA receptors and then require BDNF track B. And what we were able to show was that this was a rapid protein synthesis dependent pathway. You block NMDA receptors and BDNF is rapidly upregulated at the synapse, the point at where neurons communicate, as well as a number of synaptic proteins. And if you block protein translation, you don't see this effect. There's no effect of transcription, we looked, it's all translation. So if we think about it, you block NMDA receptors, you rapidly upregulate protein synthesis, including BDNF, track B, and you have some sort of behavioral effect, this rapid antidepressant effect. So how do you kind of combine those? How do you link those? And we could, from the literature, find many examples of how you can link NMDA receptors to rapid changes in protein synthesis to perhaps even plasticity, things like LTP, but they all require activation of NMDA receptors and ketamine blocks NMDA receptors. If you just record NMDA receptor current for a long period of time, ketamine blocks, it does not activate. So how do you block NMDA receptors, trigger this synaptic effects? And if you wanted to have rapid behavioral effects, 
regulating protein synthesis at the synapse would be a way to do it, especially glutamatergic transmission to trigger a plasticity. So we tried many different, we looked at many hypotheses and I'm gonna just hone in on what we focused on and where our data led. So within the brain, there's two types of neurotransmission. There is evoked transmission or neurotransmission at rest, spontaneous transmission. So that's what's highlighted here. On the left is evoked transmission. An action potential comes in, and this is a neuron on the presynaptic side. This is a postsynaptic side, so this is a synapse. An action potential comes in. These vesicles that contain glutamate release glutamate. It binds to the NMDA receptor. It opens, calcium comes through, and you activate CAM kinase 2, and you trigger a whole range of phosphorylation events and changes. And this is important for, for processes such as long-term potentiation LTP. The other form of neurotransmission, which has no been known for a long time, but there's been a question of what role does it play up until about the past decade? And work has started to emerge showing that spontaneous transmission is also important in the brain. What this is, is that you have vesicles that contain glutamate. These vesicles are slightly different in that they have different proteins on them than if they respond to evoke transmission. Nevertheless, when these vesicles fuse, glutamate's released, it binds to NMDA receptors. And there's no data to suggest that these are different NMDA receptors right now in terms of some unit composition, it's more of where they're located. Leaves. Glutamate binds to the NMDA receptor, calcium comes in, and you activate a different pathway, what's called eukaryotic elongation factor two kinase. And this kinase has been known for quite a while because it triggers phosphorylation of event that very quickly impacts protein synthesis within the first 30 minutes to hour. If you block these spontaneous NMDA receptors, calcium doesn't come in, you inhibit this kinase, and you rapidly desuppress, resulting in upregulation of proteins, including synaptic proteins, very quickly. All this work, and there's been a lot of cell science and nature papers really working through this, has been done in vitro. We looked with ketamine both in vitro and in vivo to see if this pathway was engaged, and it was. And it, moreover, we could show that ketamine, by, by inhibiting this kinase, appeared to be triggering BDNF upregulation by using various knockouts in animals. If we deleted this kinase, Ketamine didn't produce rapid antidepressant effects. I've already shown you BDNF. Ketamine doesn't have antidepressant effects. Moreover, since the hypothesis suggests that you inhibit this kinase to trigger these downstream effects, if we just inhibit this kinase, that was sufficient in animals to trigger a rapid and long-lasting antidepressant effect. So it appears that we have the start of a pathway of what may mediate the antidepressant effect. As Carlos mentioned though, there's this data that's been around that's been quite intriguing and there's been a lot of work that's kind of honed in on this idea of AMPA. And it's based on um, a study as Carlos presented that was done by Husseini Manji. And we replicated this early on. And what we could show is again, this was just data in the four swim test where you take animals, if you give them a vehicle, you have a baseline behavior. Wild type animals, you give them ketamine, they have this decrease in immobility suggestive of an antidepressant response. And again, we think this is through block of NMDA receptors. If you just block these AMPA receptors, nothing happens. However, if you give ketamine plus blocking the AMPA receptors, you completely block ketamine's antidepressant effect, suggesting an early involvement of AMPA receptors. AMPA receptors alone aren't doing it. Ketamine is triggering something that requires AMPA receptors. And AMPA receptors normally mean plasticity. And again, plasticity, there's different types of plasticity and there's cellular mechanisms for plasticity. So does ketamine trigger specific cellular mechanisms of plasticity? Well, we know ketamine as an NMDA receptor antagonist doesn't. We think that the hippocampus is involved for the initiation of antidepressant effects. People have looked at this for quite a while where they add, they take a, take a hippocampal slice add ketamine or an NMDA receptor antagonist, and there's no plasticity. And in fact, that's what we observed as well. However, how do you do these experiments? Well, how these experiments are done is you take your hippocampal slides, you add ketamine, and then you record two to five minutes later. You don't get an antidepressant effect in two to five minutes. So what we said is what happens if you infuse 30 to 40 minutes? 
which is the infusion for ketamine, and then look. And when we do that, rather surprising, what we see on the right is shown in black is a nice and stable form of potentiation. This is in the order of magnitude of long-term potentiation or LTP. However, this is not LTP. LTP is only elicited by activation of NMDA receptors, and this is block of NMDA receptors. This appears to be a novel form of plasticity. And what our data suggests is that this may be a form of homeostatic plasticity. It's not the typical heavy and LTP LTD, which are elicited by activation. This is block. And this idea of homeostatic plasticity has been put forth a lot because if you activate glutamate receptors, you can't stay activated in terms of potentiation forever. Or if you depress too long, you have to come back to baseline. And what we're suggesting is that by blocking these receptors, we're treating this novel and stable form of plasticity. So is it important? Well, we can show at the top that again, this is the same sort of potentiation, just plotted slightly different, that if we take and add hippocampal to our, hip, to our hippocampal slice, add ketamine, as well as a drug called TTX, which blocks evoke transmission, this other form of transmission, what we see is we still see this potentiation really suggesting it's being driven by spontaneous transmission, this other form. And if we just simply add only TTX to block evoked, we don't see this potentiation suggesting it is in fact spontaneous. We went on to look that to show what happens in terms of the, uh, the requirements molecularly. Again, with ketamine by itself, we see this potentiation. If we block this kinase EEF2, which we think is important for the antidepressant effect, if it's not present, you don't, not only do not get the antidepressant effect, but you also don't get this potentiation. BDNF, I've already shown you, was required for the behavioral effect. If we look at this potentiation, we also do not get it if we delete BDNF. We went on to look at more cellular aspects because BDNF is known to trigger the insertion of AMPA receptors. So we looked, is this pathway engaged for ketamine to trigger the insertion of AMPA receptors? And these are Western blots at the top and the quantification at the bottom. Briefly, what we were able to show is if you just take animals, normal animals, and give them ketamine, as shown in black, you get an increase in the AMPA receptor subunits GLUA1, as well as on the right, GLUA2. And if you look in the EEF2 knockout animals, these are the ones where you think once you block an MDA receptors, the first component of this pathway, you can see that ketamine does not trigger this insertion. So there's not this increase in AMPA receptors. We could also look in terms of this potentiation, if we add ketamine to the hippocampal slice and we add NASPAM, which blocks GLUA2 lacking, you still see this potentiation suggesting that GLUA2 is in fact involved. And GLUA2 is a little surprising because it has a calcium requirement. If we in the middle just simply take to ketamine on our slices and add DNQX, we block all AMPA receptors and we also lose this response. So this is clearly AMPA dependent and is both GLUA1, GLUA2 dependent. And to really hone in on the GLUA2 component, which was surprising because it's not as important for typical forms of plasticity, but for this novel form it is. If we take our GLUA2 knockout animals, which again are shown in black, if we add ketamine to the hippocampal slice in these knockouts, we don't see this potentiation showing this requirement. So we have a requirement both GLUA1 and GLUA2, and the GLUA2 knockouts also do not respond to ketamine in terms of the behavioral effects. We went on to literally look at this pathway by targeting, this is the hippocampal slice, these presynaptic vesicles that are involved in spontaneous transmission and not evoked. If we delete two particular proteins that are required for the spontaneous neurotransmission, VTI and VAMP7, and we look, we targeted both of them because we weren't sure if one would be more important than the other. What we can see is that we completely lose this potentiation. These animals also don't respond to ketamine. So this data really suggests that this low dose of ketamine could have some specificity in terms of blocking the NMDA receptors through a particular signaling mechanism and triggering this novel form of plasticity that's important for the antidepressant effect. What I can tell you is that if you go to higher doses of ketamine in the range of what you would do if you were trying to model schizophrenia or whatever, you don't engage this pathway and you don't trigger this plasticity. So there is specificity to this pathway. Moreover, if we try to um, 
examine this really from a hypothesis mechanism in terms of ketamine, comparing it to memantine, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, but does not have rapid antidepressant effects, what we can show is that it doesn't engage our pathway and it doesn't trigger this plasticity. So we think that this could, from a molecular cellular pathway, explain the specificity of why ketamine triggers its rapid effect because it's having very unique effects on the NMDA receptors in terms of the type of neurotransmission and signaling compared to other drugs. So that's what's shown here. We think that, again, just sort of in the uh, mid part of the talk, that ketamine releases glutamate, that vesicles normally release glutamate. The ketamine, by blocking the NMDA receptor, it inhibits this kinase. So you don't trigger this downstream effect of BDNF as well as other synaptic proteins that you can't insert AMPA receptors and you don't see this plasticity per se if anything is interfered in this pathway. Normally, by ketamine, by just inhibiting it, would engage this pathway to trigger the insertion of AMPA receptors and this plasticity. So we have a pathway. Memantine and ketamine were a nice comparison. We've shown that spontaneous transmission appears to be engaged. So as we continue to follow it up, we've tried to also follow in what's happening on the clinical side. How can we try to really define this and really incorporate in other work that's been done? Because this, if this pathway is important, it can't be in isolation. I wanna very briefly touch on something that I just inserted these slides on what, uh, what Carlos was talking about, this metabolite, 2R, 6R, H, and K. And this was a metabolite as Carlos mentioned, when work was being done on ketamine, they noticed it had very rapid and long lasting effects where MK-1 had only rapid effect and not long lasting effects, even though it was also an NMDA receptor antagonist. They then went in and isolated various metabolites and showed that this particular metabolite when injected into animals had rapid antidepressant effects. And um, they've argued that this metabolite was NMDA independent primarily based on, as Carlos explained, on binding studies. They look at the NMDA receptor and what they do is you take MK-1, which blocks at a specific site on the NMDA receptor, and you look to see if it can be disassociated. And you can find that ketamine can disassociate MK-1. However, this metabolite does not. And so they conclude that it's therefore NMDA independent. However, the only way that you're going to displace MK01 is if you bind at exactly the same spot and you have a high enough affinity to displace it. There's many NMDA receptor antagonists that cannot displace MK01, but they're still NMDA receptor antagonists because they bind at a different site or they have a different affinity. So that's not definitive that it's NMDA independent. The only way you could really do that would be to look at function. But as we looked at the paper, there were some things that caught our eye. And a couple are shown here. So the data from this paper is on the left, our data is on the right. And I'm going to go through this quickly to really make the point. But what we notice is that while they don't know the mechanism of this, they said it's NMDA independent, you can see that it also decreased phosphorylation of EF2. So it's inhibiting the same kinase that we suggest in our pathway. And it's also rapidly upregulating BDNF protein which I showed you was important in the hippocampus, similar to what we had shown. They really focused in though on this AMPA requirement because again, they could show that GLUR1 and GLUR2 were increased by this metabolite, similar to what we had seen. And rather surprisingly, they could show at least as they presented it, was that this metabolite, if it's perfused for long periods of time, triggers this novel form of plasticity, very similar to what we had seen. So they've really demonstrated our pathway was engaged. We're seeing the same type of plasticity. We had linked all of ours to the NMDA receptor. They argued that this was NMDA independent, but again, it was just based on binding. So we looked at the function of 2R, 6R, H, and K on the NMDA receptor. And this is a lot of electrophysiology, but what I want to just simply show you is that <coughs> if we look at synaptic NMDA receptor current, really the function Again, we did various controls. We could show that AP5, which is a very known NMDA receptor blocker, does in fact decrease the charge showing it blocks synaptic NMDA receptors. If you look here at C, you can show that 
typical ketamine, the RS ketamine does in fact block the NMDA receptor. If we look at H and K, what we see is that it takes higher doses to block it. But again, as proof of principle, it clearly is having specific effects on the NMDA receptor. And at these doses, we again see this targeted of this EEF2 pathway and BDNF, these cultures. We went on to characterize H and K more closely. And just very briefly, what we can show is that this 2R, 6R H and K decreases miniature EPSC amplitudes and a change in decay time that's shown here. What does this mean? Because I'm just glossing over this quickly. This looks exactly like ketamine. It looks exactly like ketamine in the block of the NMDA receptor in terms of its kinetics and its profile. So what do we think this could mean? Well, what we think it could mean is that ketamine by blocking the NMDA receptor triggers this pathway. And as it's metabolized, this metabolite may then block the NMDA receptor to extend ketamine's effects, which you don't see with other NMDA receptor antagonists. We'll see, but that's sort of the hypothesis. But other ways to think about this could mean, in fact, from a clinical standpoint, is that if 2R6R, if 2R6R HNK produces a rapid antidepressant effect, would it also produce this prolonged effect because it's already the metabolite? You'd expect it couldn't. If this metabolite is truly important, as it's suggested compared to the other metabolites, then would, two, would, would our ketamine have potentially rapid and long lasting effects, which you wouldn't expect the long lasting effects with S ketamine. So we'll see, but it's interesting to kind of think about this idea. And in terms of the dose effect, the comment is always, well, these are not what's found, uh, you know, at the, the doses that are relevant. We don't know the doses that are relevant. We know from work in terms of the NMDA receptor synaptically, the amount of glutamate it takes to activate it is very, very low. And it's the same with block. We don't know the concentrations of these drugs at the synapse but clearly there appears to be effects. So the idea metabolite could extend is not necessarily surprising. So what I'm showing you is that ketamine by blocking this NMDA receptor has very rapid effects, including this plasticity that we think drives this rapid effects. But what I wanted to show you in the last three slides is that you have these long-term effects out for more than a week. So while this all makes sense, if you wanted to have a rapid behavioral effect targeting dendritic protein synthesis that's gonna impact synaptic transmission quickly, inducing a novel form of plasticity could make sense. But again, how do you get out to these effects lasting for days and in some patients for more than a week or longer? Well, it suggests there has to be transcriptional mechanisms. You have to be turning on genes downstream. So what genes are you turning on? So we did a screen looking at transcriptional factors a week after we gave a single dose of ketamine. And we really expected we would see many things regulated. And we were rather surprised and disappointed that we didn't. We looked at many transcription factors, including Krebs phosphorylation, meth. They were unchanged. However, there was one we did pick up that was changed. And that was a factor called MECP2. And MECP2 is a transcriptional factor that um, is uh, no, a known regulator of gene expression. What we did is what's shown here on the left is Western blots. It's quantified here in B, which I'll show you. So as I showed you before, BDNF is rapidly upregulated by ketamine. It appears to be required. It's back down pretty quickly, actually. But by seven days, it's definitely a bad baseline. This transcription factor, this phosphorylation, if we block transcription when we give ketamine, we don't block the rapid effects. They're still there. However, when we look a week out, what's interesting is that while this transcription factor, the activation, this phosphorylation site doesn't change early on, by seven days, it is rapidly upregulated. It was the only one that we found that was. So we did a lot of work trying to really work out how this comes together. And we could actually link this to this pathway of EEF2, BDNF, track B downstream. But is this important just because it's upregulated? I mean, this is one of the problems with the ketamine literature when people talk about mechanism. Ketamine is gonna do many different things. That doesn't mean that they're all important for an antidepressant effect. So how do you tease that apart? So what we did is we obtained mice of these 
animals where there was a knockout at this particular phosphorylation site. And what's shown here on the left is if we give ketamine and we look early on. So again, the wild type animals are on the left. These knockout animals, they just have the phosphorylation mutant is shown on the right. If we give the wild type animals just saline compared to the MECP2 with saline, there's no difference in the baseline behavior. If you give the animals ketamine and look early on, the wild type animals have this decrease in mobility, suggesting that ketamine produces this rapid effect. But if you look in the MECP2 knock-in animals, they also respond rapidly to ketamine, suggesting as we predicted, the MECP2 is not required for the rapid effects. However, when we look long-term, what we see is again, these are different animals. You give ketamine and look a week later, while we could still detect the effects in wild type animals as a significant decrease in immobility in the wild types, it's blocked in the MECP2 knockout, suggesting that ketamine and this long-term effect requires this transcription factor. So it's extending the pathway, but how can we further test this? So we know that if we give ketamine, we can detect these behavioral effects seven days later. What about this plasticity? Well, we cannot detect the plasticity in the hippocampus seven days later, which we think makes sense because if the hippocampus is important for the initiation of the antidepressant effects and you engage this plasticity, and then our data really suggested this plasticity engages the cortex and then from the cortex, other brain regions, then you wouldn't accept the plasticity to still just be hanging around in the hippocampus. It's moved on, it's engaged other pathways. So what we did is we said, well, what's gonna be important is repeated ketamine. And as people have started to look clinically, when you give ketamine, there's been the concern that what happens if you repeat ketamine? You know, will you start to desensitize? Will you need higher doses? And really, if anything, that data has suggested that clinically ketamine appears to actually be quite robust when you give it again. If you give it one day and then a week later, it seems quite robust. If anything, it nearly has cumulative effects. So what we did is we took animals and we gave them a dose of ketamine. And then we looked seven days later and gave them a second dose of ketamine. So what we show here on the left is the same data I've been showing you all the way through. This is just a single dose of ketamine and with a single dose of ketamine, you have this baseline, you get the ketamine 30 to 40 minutes, and we see that we get this nice plasticity. But again, what happens if you give repeated ketamine? And that's what's shown in C. If we give the repeated ketamine and then look at this potentiation, what we see is we see a plasticity of plasticity. It's much higher than the single dose of ketamine. It's a metaplasticity is what we believe. This very nice and stable form of metaplasticity is dependent on this transcription factor. If we look at this plasticity with this MECP2 knock-in animals, while we can elicit the rapid form of potentiation, we don't get this metaplasticity. So we think that this may explain why you have this engagement of this pathway further priming, if you will, like ketamine is priming it such that when you see it again, it becomes better. Now at some point, you're not gonna be able to get in, continue to increase it forever, but it might explain while the second and third doses of ketamine can have more pronounced effects. So again, what I've showed you is the idea that ketamine by having this very rapid effect that through a particular pathway on protein translation triggers this form of synaptic potentiation slash plasticity and it's novel, it's interesting. And the fact that it doesn't interfere with LTP or LTD is intriguing because it suggests that it doesn't occur, it doesn't interfere with baseline effects of typical cognitive processes to trigger the antidepressant effects. And that this form of plasticity, when you give repeated ketamine, is either further enhanced, which may contribute to the enhanced antidepressant effects that are being observed. So I'm going to stop now and just conclude. What we're proposing is a testable model as truly the molecular mechanism of ketamine action. And we're continuing to refine it as we go through, but it does explain, you know, the ketamine and memantine effects, as well as other drugs that don't elicit this plasticity, don't have antidepressant effects. So this form of potentiation we think is important and um, for the, it may be driving the behavioral effects. I've shown you that this metabolite by blocking synaptic NMDA receptors is similar to ketamine acting as an open channel blocker like ketamine.
that it may be extending it and it may have implications towards to our, to, to, between R ketamine and S ketamine if this metabolite is important. And that may be why ketamine has the long term effects, but together, this is what's priming the system such that when we give repeated ketamine, we're seeing this metaplasticity, if you will, this higher potentiation. And so again, we're proposing that this plasticity is important for driving the antidepressant effect. And if it is, then could you identify drugs that could just trigger this potentiation? Would they have rapid antidepressant effects? And lastly, by working through this pathway, is there a potential point of convergence with typical antidepressants. It's not gonna be through blocking the NMDA receptor, this rapid pathway, even this rapid potentiation, but is there a potential point of convergence that's necessary for how antidepressants work? And can we work backwards to try and work through that and really try to understand for the first time what triggers typical antidepressant responses from monoaminergic drugs? So with that, I'm happy to stop and acknowledge the following individuals. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa. Um, we've got just a very few minutes and I'm sorry that we have such little okay. time, but we've got time for a couple of questions from the floor here. Um, Mike. Uh, Thanks very much uh, for a really great talk. I think you said that uh, your pathway specifically activated with lower dose ketamine and that it mm -hmm. wasn't affected with higher dose ketamine. Yes. So do, you, do you have any sense of why higher dose no longer activates that, path, that pathway? Because I guess that might have clinical implications. So what we're thinking is that... Um, at this very low dose of ketamine, which again, even clinically higher doses, you see very different behavioral effects. So at this very low dose of ketamine, you may be able to have some specificity in terms of the NMDA receptors, which we think you know were involved, the sort of spontaneous ones and the pathway. When you get to higher doses of ketamine, you're just blocking all NMDA receptors, which are probably contributing to some of the adverse effects. And at very high doses, like anesthetic effects, you may be starting to see off-target effects because there's many different systems that could be engaged. So how we're thinking about it is that when you get to higher doses, you're just starting to interfere in general, which is why you don't pick up these plasticity effects. Jerry. Hey Lisa, it's Jerry Senecor from Yale. How are you? Hi, Jerry. Lisa, I know we talked about it before in the past, but do you think there's anything unique about the NMDA receptors associated with spontaneous signaling? So in other words, the... Yeah, so right now there's no data to suggest it's due to specificity of NMDA receptor subunits. Um, it doesn't mean it couldn't be, but what's been looked at, there's no data to suggest it. It appears more where they're at in the synapse to trigger synaptic transmission. Um, I know you and I have talked about some of the work that is suggested in our 2B is important. Um, and this was work done by knockouts where if you delete in our 2B on excitatory neurons, um, you lose ketamine's antidepressant effects, not 2A. And um, because of this, people have talked a lot about 2B being potential targets, the NR2B compounds being uh, specific targets as rapid antidepressants. And that's possible, but I don't think it necessarily provides any way to get around potential side effects. And the 2B to the 2A effects may simply be due to the biophysical nature of the NMDA receptor if it contains 2B. If you have the 2B subunit, you have an open longer probability time of release, which is what's required for ketamine to integrate into and block the pore. So it may just simply be NR2B could be important because ketamine can block that, those something is more efficiently than 2A. And how about location, synaptic location? So synaptic location is where they're actually located in the synapse, more medial to more lateral. So that appears to be important, but they're all synaptic. They're not the idea of the extra synaptic because of the low doses of glutamate that are that are involved in terms of NMDA receptor activation, as well as the low doses that can block NMDA receptors of drugs with drugs. Okay. 
Okay, well, so look, thank you very much indeed. Yes, yes.